Uh, thank you very much. Thanks all for coming. Um, it's been a great event so far, isn't it? Uh, actually, I don't want to give my talk. I want to talk to the previous session speakers. Uh, that'd be much more interesting, and I can see some of the organisers are panicking, because I'm not joking. Uh, no, I, I am. Um, also, before I begin, uh, I know Calamity Cake, so Becky, if you're watching, I'll split the prize with you. Uh, well done. Good job. Right, so uh, my talk today. Um, let's see. Would you like to have more money? Of course you would. Who wouldn't? Uh, what if I told you I could guarantee you a return on your investment of 20% a year? Guarantee. Let's say you invest an initial £10,000, and after a short period of time during which your portfolio is set up, you start to receive cheques that do indeed seem to be giving you an annual return of 20%. That's amazing. It's well beyond the performance of any other fund you've heard about. What's even more amazing is that none of that £10,000 bought any stocks and shares. Rather, it was the down payment on a new sports car that I'm currently driving around. <laughs> yeah, I spent all your money. Um, but those cheques you receive are real. You can cash them. That money comes from Jack. You see, Jack, like you, was looking for market-beating returns. And I took £20,000 of his money. I didn't spend all of it, only half. The other half I put into a bank account that pays out regular cheques to you. I initially paid Jack from some of his own money as well, but soon word got around about this incredible investor. That's me. And people were asking me to join the fund. Typically, I take about half of whatever they invest, and the rest pays people higher up the chain. Earlier investors continue to get these amazing returns, and I get to enjoy the lifestyle I deserve. Everyone's a winner. Well, except the news investors, of course. They don't get anything. But they will as soon as somebody else signs up. Charles Ponzi, an American businessman, well, fraudster, <laughs> gave his name to this classic scam, the Ponzi scheme. Now, Charles didn't invent it, and his scheme hasn't proved to be the largest. In 2008, Bernie Madoff was arrested and ultimately convicted of running an elaborate Ponzi scheme which made off with over $64 billion. Now, at the time, a number of individuals attempted to alert the authorities about Madoff's activities. And even though the numbers didn't add up, I mean, they couldn't add up, investors wanted to believe that Madoff was somehow able to defy economic gravity. I guess we'd all like to believe that we're not stupid enough, not greedy enough, to fall for a Ponzi scheme. But greed appears to be an important driver in the development of our civilization's history. You make a product and service, sell it, and with the profit, you can make more products and services. More innovation, more products, more profits, more innovation. The argument goes that the Industrial Revolution may have been initially powered by coal, but it was able to spread from England to the rest of the world by taking advantage of our greed, our constant desire for more. Industrialization, innovation, and development has had some tremendously positive impacts. At the start of the 20th century, the global average life expectancy was 31. It is now 67. People live longer, healthier lives, thanks to improvements in medicine, sanitation, and diets. In fact, it's been the significant decrease in death rates, which has been one of the reasons there's been such a significant increase in the total numbers of humans. In my lifetime, the world's population has doubled, and a child born today has a better than 50% chance of reaching to be 100 years old. With good prospects, they'll have a much more comfortable life than I did. But it's becoming increasingly clear that there are limits to this trajectory, and that the process of industrialization is having an increasingly negative impact on a range of planetary processes that we all rely on. Over 150 years ago, British physicist John Tyndall established that the Earth's atmosphere has an important greenhouse effect. In the 1890s, Swedish physicist Svante Arrhenius proved that increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would increase this greenhouse effect and so increase temperatures on the surface of the planet. In 1958, American geochemist Charles David Keeling began the first direct measurements of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. By 1960, he detected a strong annual cycle and a year later, a clearly increasing trend, a trend that continues to this day. Using proxy data, such as air bubbles that have been trapped in ice cores, we can look back into Earth's past and conclude there hasn't been this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for at least 800,000 years. In its recent round of reports, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has concluded that it is now 95% certain that it is us who are responsible for this dramatic increase in carbon dioxide and that the prospects of our global industrialized civilization are not good if we continue business as usual. But affecting the composition of the Earth's atmosphere isn't it the only inadvertent byproduct of industrialization. 
We are currently in the middle of what some argue to be one of the great mass extinction events in the history of life on Earth. The current rates of extinction are thousands, maybe even tens of thousands times higher than the background rate. Now, when you think about extinction, you might think about extinct species like the dodo or woolly mammoth, or endangered species like tigers and rhinos. But most species that have gone extinct, you've never heard about, because they disappeared as a result of habitat destruction. The tropical rainforests, the great stalls of biodiversity in the Earth system, and we've cut down over half of them. And at current rates of deforestation, there's going to be less than a quarter left by the middle of this century. By which time, there'll be 9 billion people alive on planet Earth for whom we will have to produce 50% more food, generate 50% more power, and gain access to 30% more fresh water. All at the same time as making 50% reductions in our carbon emissions in order to avoid dangerous climate change. We're facing this perfect storm of environmental challenges. Now, as daunting as that all sounds, it's not impossible. We don't need widespread nuclear fusion in order to make the required reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. We don't need science fiction levels of science and technology in order to ensure that nobody goes hungry and everybody's needs are met. So why aren't we doing it? Why do we see the continual inability of the international community to put in place the incentives to change? Why do we see the continual destruction of vital elements of the Earth system? Why do people keep chopping down the rainforests? We in the United Kingdom understand our obligations and responsibilities. We're making great efforts to restore habitats and to reduce our emissions, but other countries aren't. Other countries aren't playing fair, are they? Well, unfortunately, in a number of important regards, the United Kingdom is actually one of the worst offenders. We often don't see it because we've undertaken so much development. Here's a question for you. How far do you have to travel from this lovely lecture theatre in Milton Keynes to find three square miles of ancient, undisturbed woodland? Woodland that hasn't been affected by humans for at least 400 years. How far do you have to travel? Yes, sir. Scotland. Pardon? Scotland. Scotland. Good guess. You won't find any. In 2011, the Woodland Trust concluded that the best you'll do are 14 patches that will be a little larger than one square mile. In pre-Neolithic times, woodland dominated most of the land surface of the United Kingdom. Since then, we've cut down 98% of that forest. And the remaining 2% are scattered around the country in small fragments. This country was the first to industrialize, and we have reaped its rewards. Who are we to deny others the things that we take for granted? Moreover, a tragic irony with climate change is that those countries that have contributed least to the problem, those countries that have emitted the least amounts of carbon dioxide, are typically those very same countries that will be most strongly affected by it because they have the least resources to adapt to climate change. It would be immoral for us to pull up the ladder of development just because we got here first. So instead, we should reach out and help them. And in order to do that, we need to share the resources of the Earth more equitably. And perhaps that's the greatest challenge. We need to change our behavior. And can we do that? Do you think we've got it in us? I do. In 2012, insurer Liverpool Victoria estimated that to support a child born in the United Kingdom up to the age of 21 costs, on average, 215,000 pounds. Now, my wife and I never had any particular numbers in our heads when we were considering starting a family, but we knew it was going to be a significant financial commitment. So, <clears throat> imagine our surprise, let's say, <laughs> when we had twins. That's approaching half a million pounds. <laughs> or or $720,000. But more significantly than the money, or the lack of money, was the impact these little people had. Before their birth, my mother used to tell us, our lives will completely change. Nothing will be the same again. Yeah, like she ever had children. Well, obviously she had children, but in the 1970s, you know, no internet or Teletubbies, or microwaves or decent disposable nappies, you know, things are different now. Our lives completely changed. <laughs> the first six months were a sleep deprived blur and I struggled, I really struggled. I couldn't accept the life I had previously was abruptly over. Parting in the evenings, laying it at the weekends. It took me quite some time to realize that yes, that life is over but a new one had taken its place, and it was a life of awesome responsibilities. These two little people depended on us entirely, and even though over time they've learned to feed themselves, clothe themselves, become these beautiful little characters, I'm still central to their lives. I'm still their dad, and I will be for the rest of my life. 
I like to think I give my children a great deal, but I'm at risk of taking much, much more. Because through my hard work, my labor, through the products and services that I buy that cycles through the economy, I further propel us down the road of innovation and development. I further incur environmental costs. I'm at risk of actually participating, no, in fact, running a Ponzi scheme, an intergenerational Ponzi scheme, from my children, from future children, future generations. I take what is as much theirs as mine, the resources of the earth, and I say to them, give them to me now, and I will invest them in ways that will pay back handsomely by the time you need them. It just so happens that in doing so, I'm amply rewarded with material possessions right now. It's sort of a byproduct of innovation, or perhaps it's my cut. What this means is that rather leave resources in place for you, I will exploit them as fast as I possibly can. And if they run out, well, I'll just discover new resources. And if they run out, well, you'll have sufficient technology to discover other resources, as well as clean up any mess I've left behind. But this exponentially increasing process, just like any Ponzi scheme, cannot last. Either the fraudster runs off with the money, they get busted, or the ever-increasing requirement for new investors cannot be sustained, and the system collapses. For this scheme, there is no one to stop us. Our children, our future generations, they do not have any voice, they do not have any power. We'll either stop willingly, throttle back and live within our means, or continue, addicted to the notion that somehow we can outrun the consequences of our actions, that a cure, or perhaps the next fix, is around the next corner. So rather than slow down, we put our foot to the floor and go faster and faster with the hope that at some point in the future when civilization finds itself in midair, they have sufficient time, technology and resources to fashion themselves a pair of wings with which to keep themselves aloft. They'll be able to defy gravity and perhaps many other laws of physics too. If I love my children, if I care about their well-being, the well-being of future children and future generations, then I must accept the consequences of my actions on them. There is no buy one, get one free deal when it comes to planets. Yes, our current rates of consumption require one and a half Earths to support. This must change. We as individuals, as society, as species, must accept that life has changed. Our incredible story of innovation and development, it's not over, but it's different now. And in its place is something much more profound. A deeper appreciation of our impacts on the Earth, on each other, and the awareness that these impacts can persist long after we have gone. And that's an awesome responsibility. Knowing that gives us an opportunity to cherish and protect the things we value on Earth right now and work to ensure that others will be able to enjoy them when their time comes to live on our home planet. Thank you. <laughs>